the sinister has always lingered in the shadows of our world, biding its time. Whether these entities have become more pronounced due to the rapid spread of technology, the overpopulation crisis, or some dark forces set loose, remains a mystery. But this tale, every inkling of it, is as real as the breath you take. Having served with the Green Berets, my name is Reyna. We've battled more than mere mortals on the front lines. The nefarious Neff and other dark entities have felt our wrath. As a citizen, you have the right to know that while factions within our government fight against these creatures for your safety, there's a darker underside, elements that play right into their hands. Flashback to 2009, Afghanistan. The days after we'd eliminated the gargantuan monster were clouded by a dream I couldn't shake off. I was in a realm of perpetual darkness, the only beacon of light emanated from me. My every step was accompanied by a weightless sensation. Desperation surged through me as I sprinted in every direction, shouting for salvation. Hours, days, maybe even years seemed to pass until defeat wore me down, and I resigned to the black void around. Just when I had accepted my eternal fate, a sickening realization gnawed at me, the familiar aura of dread I'd felt when confronting the beast. Oh no, not this, I murmured. But there it was, the giant we'd put down, emerging from the shadows. Only now its eyes weren't yellow but bore red pupils, staring deep into my soul, accusingly. You banished me to this desolation, you and your precious deity, it hissed. As its massive hand stretched out to claim me, a blinding ray of light shot through the scene. A scream, one of both anger and pain, echoed, and suddenly I was jerked back to reality. Gasping for air, I was back in my bed, my clothes soaked in a cold sweat. The eerie sensation clung to me, suggesting that I had ventured somewhere forbidden. My fellow soldier Torres slept soundly in the adjacent room. I was distracted from my thoughts as the shipping container we rested in vibrated violently. My equipment, hung up for the night, clattered to the floor. I was reminded of our location, Bad Graham, one of Afghanistan's newest coalition air bases where machinery of war took to the skies day and night. As the noise echoed, Torres barked out, Damn it, Rena, some of us are trying to sleep here. I could hear him laugh softly, but the playfulness didn't last long. My focus shifted to arming myself. I picked up my Glock, expertly releasing the magazine and inspecting the chambered round before re-engaging it. The sound of the mag clicking into place was reassuring. After ensuring my arsenal weapons, grenades, and more were all in place, I stepped out into the rising sun. The heat was intense, but it was a sensation I had grown used to. The sun glared, prompting me to slip on my Oakley sunglasses. Looking around, it was clear I stood out. While I adhered to my Green Beret uniform, the base was filled with a mix of individuals, some in uniform, some in casual wear. This was the face of modern warfare, a mix of the structured and the maverick. On that Afghan base, my clean-shaven face, short-cropped hair, and uniform distinguished me from the motley crowd. The Rangers, among the few spec op units that conformed to the traditional soldier's appearance, was what I belonged to. At 24, the gold bar of a second lieutenant felt more like a burden than an honor on my chest, drawing unwanted attention like a bullseye on a target. Such a rank, especially amidst these seasoned soldiers, felt akin to a fledgling player leading a veteran football team. Though technically higher in command than many, I heavily relied on their experiences soaking in their wisdom, and bracing myself for the teasing rituals. Stepping into the Tactical Operations Center, TOC, I was greeted by a much more subdued atmosphere. Soldiers were fixated on their screens, tracking troop movements. Many sipped their coffees, some engaged in mundane chatter about football, while others appeared drained, resembling the walking dead. As I navigated the room, my thoughts wandered to the events of the previous night. They seemed oblivious to the supernatural encounter, and maybe that was for the best. Lieutenant Mitchell, a towering figure at six or four inches with salt and pepper hair, beckoned me. Stories whispered in hushed tones spoke of his brush with death, losing a significant part of his calf in an IED attack. His pace, however, betrayed none of his injuries. In a private conference room, he commended my recent actions and hinted at a shift in my duties. His use of the word trust hinted at deeper layers, 
hidden missions, and veiled threats. He was reassigning me from the platoon to the personal security detail, PSD team. For most soldiers, PSD was an undesirable assignment while on foreign soil. It's akin to what the Secret Service does, guarding VIPs. Though in normal circumstances, it was a prestigious task. One I've had the honor of fulfilling for dignitaries, including presidents and even the Queen of England. In a war zone, however, most soldiers, including myself, wished to be the striking force rather than the protective shield. Lieutenant Mitchell handed me a phone, emphasizing its security, especially against the Hajis. That statement lingered with me, suggesting a deeper web of surveillance beyond the obvious enemy. I left the talk, my heart heavy. Being part of the PSD meant becoming a protective shadow to high-ranking officials, attending top-level discussions, and witnessing firsthand the complex politics of war. The subsequent weeks blurred into a hectic rhythm of guarding high-profile figures, thwarting assaults, and miraculously escaping life-threatening situations, including an IED attack and a bullet wound to my arm. But beyond the physical battles, a deeper unease grew within. There was a sense that the supernatural events were not isolated, and that the shadows we fought weren't just those cast by enemies. The real war was only beginning. Despite having escaped a multitude of perils, from bullets to IEDs, and despite the adrenaline and commendation that came with such experiences, a lingering unease consumed me. The phantom scar left by that otherworldly entity, the giant, served as a persistent reminder of a more sinister battle. A battle not against men, but against darkness itself. The cryptic promise of Timothy and the mysterious number 357 only added layers to the enigma. Days turned into a restless wait for answers that seemed ever elusive. This tranquility was shattered one day by an unexpected arrival. A trio of individuals, distinctly out of place, sauntered into my office. Two of them sported khakis, black polo shirts emblazoned with CBTI, and bore no resemblance to the rugged soldiers or seasoned spies I had come to recognize. Their civilian attire screamed non-combatant, but it was the third, Mike, who caught my attention. With a demeanor akin to everyone's affable uncle, he exuded an authenticity seldom seen in these parts. Introducing himself with a warm handshake and disarming smile, Mike's reference to my first name, Micah, a detail known to only a select few like Lieutenant Mitchell, raised my guard instantly. He spoke of a mission requiring our expertise and the collaboration of my fellow Green Beret Torres. His evasiveness when pressed for details felt oddly reminiscent of Timothy's earlier cryptic behavior. Yet, the aura around Mike was entirely different, genuine and almost endearing. His departure, punctuated by a nerdy fist bump, was as surprising as his entrance, leaving behind more questions than answers. The two CBTI representatives, despite their corporate appearance, briefed us about deploying orbs across Afghanistan, devices showcasing some novel technology. As much as I prodded, the specifics of this technology remained shrouded in secrecy. Once they left, Torres and I exchanged puzzled glances. He shed light on their true identity, CIA contractors. Often hired from tech and engineering giants, these individuals worked on innovative projects for the agency. It was no secret within the special ops community that our relationship with the CIA was, at best, strained. While we shared a common goal of safeguarding the nation, the methodologies and ethos diverged sharply. We, the Green Berets and our Spec Ops brethren, took pride in operating within the shadows, acting as silent guardians. In contrast, the murky waters of intelligence sometimes meant misdirection and secrecy, even from allies. This often left one side wanting, usually us, considering the intel mismatch. The CIA's reluctance to divulge the giant's existence, and now this ambiguous mission, only intensified my skepticism. Our dedication to the nation was unwavering, but the convolution of the missions and the secrets maintained by the intelligence community often felt like a gulf between our respective agencies. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the Afghan terrain, I realized that our next mission might not just test our physical prowess, but challenge the very essence of our trust and loyalty. In the ever-changing theater of war, allegiances are everything, an unspoken understanding was that one must be vigilant, not just about the explicit threats from insurgents, but also from the secretive nature of our own allied agencies. 
So, when Mitchell spoke of Mike with an unexpected trust, it was perplexing. To say a CIA operative was one of the good guys defied the established understanding, sowing the seeds of doubt. How were we to differentiate between those truly on our side and those with ulterior motives? As the evening hues painted the Afghan skyline, I made my way to the helipad. My apprehension grew as I recognized the familiar hum of the helicopter. It belonged to the Elite 160th, the same one that rescued us post our encounter with the giant. A nod from the pilot only deepened the mystery, and I wondered how deep this rabbit hole went. Being in the Black Hawk was an unparalleled experience. Every rise, every turn, every tilt sent a rush of adrenaline through the veins. As Torres and I absorbed the scene below, Mike's voice sliced through the roar of the rotors, directing us to a cave. With military precision, we disembarked, taking positions while engineers set a robot to work. The strange orbs it carried had us puzzled, but our questions were met with silence. This enigmatic mission repeated night after night. Twelve-hour shifts that saw us hovering over Afghanistan, releasing orbs and watching the robot delve into caves. The repetitive nature, coupled with the secrecy surrounding our task, frustrated Torres and me. We questioned our role, longing for clarity amid the mysterious operations. However, it was the moment's post-mission that held a certain charm. Mike and I, two soldiers from different worlds, found solace in the simple act of sharing cigars. Underneath the Afghan stars, he spoke of his family, of his reasons for joining the CIA, and intriguingly, of revealing the truth, always emphasizing the capital T. There was a sincerity in his voice, a desire to protect that I found relatable. Yet, it was his intimate knowledge of my past that both startled and intrigued me. As we shared stories of our faith and youth, I pondered on the depth of his knowledge. How did he know of my private Christian high school in Nebraska, or of my athletic pursuits? Our debates about faith and Christianity only further highlighted the duality of our relationship. A CIA operative and a Green Beret, finding common ground in shared beliefs, yet separated by the inherent nature of our roles. The crucifix Mike constantly fidgeted with, the rosary beads that seemed to calm his nerves, hinted at a deeper turmoil. It was evident that Mike bore his own scars, perhaps not from physical battles, but from internal conflicts. The crucifix, symbolic of faith and protection, felt like a shield against an ever-looming darkness, a force we were yet to face. In the complex maze of emotions that war brings, Mike gradually transformed from an enigma to a familiar presence. It was in those fleeting moments of solace between our intense missions that I began to see him less as a mysterious CIA operative and more as a guiding figure, much like a protective uncle. Every conversation, always laden with respect and insight, felt like navigating a treasure map with missing pieces. There were times when Mike's eyes would convey something deeper, something more profound about our mission. Yet each time he would stop short, as if battling with himself on whether to share it. One such night, after yet another intensive operation, Mike beckoned me over under the moonlit Afghan sky. A solemn stillness had settled over the cop, disrupted only by the occasional footsteps of the watchful soldiers. I felt a strange unease as Mike scanned me with an odd wand, reminiscent of airport security. My sense of discomfort only heightened as he led me beyond the perimeter, a decision that felt borderline reckless given our location. The next moments felt surreal. Mike, with the grace of an artist unveiling a masterpiece, activated the very orbs we had been scattering across Afghanistan. Before my eyes, they illuminated, navigating autonomously into a nearby cavern. With a simple nod, Mike invited me to witness the magic unfolding on his laptop. The cavern's interior, captured with unparalleled detail, danced before my eyes. I was staring at a 360-degree panoramic view, so detailed that even minuscule insects caught mid-flight were visible. The realization hit me hard. We had been meticulously mapping Afghanistan's caves. This is a game-changer, I whispered, thinking of the strategic advantages such intricate knowledge would provide against adversaries like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. But Mike, with that enigmatic smile of his, raised his hand and whispered, Think bigger. His cryptic response left a myriad of questions unanswered, but time was not on our side, and we returned to camp, 
leaving the mysteries of the night behind. The subsequent morning marked yet another twist in our Afghan odyssey. Mike, Torres, and I embarked on a journey to a remote village, guided by the local Kiwis. The village, a quaint collection of mud-bricked homes, held an aura of age-old secrets. An elderly Afghan, with wisdom etched on his face, welcomed Mike like an old friend. After customary greetings and indulging in traditional Afghan delicacies, the real purpose of our visit became clear. This village elder, Mike began, translating the man's words, is a trusted confidant and my guide to the mysteries of Afghanistan. He was the one who introduced me to the legends of the giants when I was younger, much like your age now. Listening with bated breath, we were ushered into a world of age-old folklore. The elder recounted tales of the feared beast, a creature that held villages captive under its terrifying shadow. Stories of these creatures were not just tales to scare children, but were rooted in very real experiences. The elderly man painted a vivid picture of his youth, a time when he, along with his friends, decided to challenge these legends. Their nocturnal adventure, filled with the thrill of defiance, soon turned into a horrifying encounter. A beast, towering and monstrous, had ambushed them. The chilling tale of how it brutally ended the life of one of his friends, the sound of bones breaking and the terror it evoked, was enough to send shivers down our spines. As the elder's haunting tale concluded, the weight of Mike's earlier statement, think bigger, bore down on me with a newfound clarity. The vast mapped caves, the legends of the giants, our role as Green Berets, it was all intertwined in a narrative far grander than I had ever imagined. Reeling from the weight of the elder's chilling narrative, I was trying to process the intertwined legacy of local myths, war-torn realities, and the depth of our commitment as Green Berets. The elder recounted the moments following the beast's brutal assault, describing its gaze upon him. Disturbingly, it uttered a language unfamiliar to him, but shockingly, the only word he could discern was my name. The sheer audacity of the creature to obliterate one friend and savor another, all while maintaining eye contact, was a profound reflection of its malevolent nature. The elder's tears flowed freely, and his pain felt palpable. But in the shadow of this tragedy was a sliver of redemption, symbolized by Mike's past intervention. Mike, alongside his fellow Americans, had faced the beast, ultimately vanquishing it. With its demise, a semblance of peace returned to the village, and the elder, once tormented by nightmarish memories, found solace. Expressing gratitude for the meal and the tales shared, we exchanged gifts, reasserting the bond formed in the crucible of adversity. Mike, through a heartfelt embrace, used the Pashto term for friend when addressing the elder, signaling the depth of their bond. As we left, my mind raced with thoughts of giant yellow eyes, symbols of terror that had gripped innocent villagers. The new dawn heralded unexpected developments. Mike, his demeanor profoundly serious yet reassuring, revealed our mission's conclusion. He praised both Torres and me for our dedication, entrusting me with an item discreetly tucked into my uniform pocket. Alluding to a new mission, Mike hinted that someone named Michelin was expecting us. Before I could probe further, Mike, with a characteristic grin, offered a playful fist bump and disappeared into the distance. Soon after, we embarked on a flight through Afghanistan's rugged terrains. The landscape, with its snow-capped peaks and jagged mountains, seemed eerily unfamiliar, despite our recent explorations. The Black Hawk executed a sharp maneuver, descending into a concealed cop. This outpost, hidden between formidable mountain peaks, remained elusive even to someone well acquainted with Afghan terrains like myself. Its strategic positioning was perplexing. Nestled at the base of a concealed pass and encircled by sheer cliffs, it seemed vulnerable. Only a handful of daredevil pilots would dare approach such a precarious landing spot. The low ground location made it susceptible to ambushes. My war instincts were buzzing with alertness. Upon disembarking, I was met with an unexpectedly warm welcome from Timothy, who seemed out of character with his broad grin. The sense of peculiarity grew as we approached the Tactical Operations Center, TOC. Although it appeared typical, with its array of screens and personnel engrossed in radio chatter, a pair of heavily armed team guys, alert and poised, stood guard. Timothy, sensing our curiosity, remarked, 
we're among friends here. And with that, he initiated a mechanism that caused the shelving unit to shift, revealing something concealed, something that promised more mysteries to unravel. The unmistakable sound of sliding metal broke the room's tense ambiance. As the large shelf receded, an intricate staircase unveiled itself. Timothy, with a jesting tone laced with intrigue, quipped, Hope you've steeled yourself for what's to come, accompanying it with a mischievous grin. The gravity of our surroundings wasn't lost on me, yet his humor was oddly comforting. With a decisive nod, he gestured for us to follow him down into the depths below. At the base of this clandestine stairwell stood an unassuming door. Timothy's rhythmic knock, a sequence of three distinct taps, seemed to serve as a coded invitation. Upon receiving an affirmation from the other side, we stepped into a vast conference room, its ambiance exuding an intense aura of secrecy. Dominating the room was a massive table, surrounded by various personnel engrossed in their discussions. Mitchell, a figure of authority I had heard much about, presided at the helm, orchestrating an intelligence briefing via a projector screen. Recognizable faces like Captain Brown mingled with new ones, a confluence of elite forces from around the globe. I noted representatives from the CIA, Britain's SAS, Australia's SAS, Canada's JTF-2, and even an Israeli commando who I'd later come to know had served in the elite Sayeret Matkal unit. A singular Afghan commando sat there too, a symbol of our alliances and the trust we'd fostered. The room's walls were veritable tapestries of information. Multiple screens flashed with data, while corkboards bore witness to a myriad of creatures and maps. Among the plethora of information, one creature stood out. The giant we had encountered, now labeled as a Nephilim. The mere sight of it sent chills down my spine. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Other, more sinister entities filled the spaces, from beings that resembled the myths of angels and Greek deities, to those marked as Watchers and Fallen Angels. Each image seemed to carry with it centuries of lore and intrigue. Torres, ever the picture of confidence, winked at me, making his way to an empty seat, clearly indicating I was to follow suit. Mitchell addressed him with a familiarity that spoke of past encounters. Welcome back, Torres. Then his gaze shifted to me, sizing me up momentarily before breaking into a welcoming nod. You've stepped into the realm of Task Force Titan. Our trust in you is absolute. So tell me, he began, his voice resolute and challenging. Are you ready to confront and vanquish the tangible embodiments of malevolence itself? The room's air grew thick with anticipation, awaiting my response.